recording. All right. So I'd like to introduce to everyone uh, Professor Adams. Uh, professor Adams uh, is a professor in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Ottawa. Uh, prior to his academic appointment in 2003, he spent 13 years in the industry working on the design and standardization of several cryptographic and security technologies for the internet. His research interests span applied cryptography, security, and privacy, including the CAST family of symmetric encryption protocols, um, uh, secure protocols for uh, public key infrastructure environments, access control in electronic networks, and also privacy enhancer technologies. Today, Professor Adams will talk about choosing privacy uh, in the real world. And without further ado, I would uh, ask Professor Adams to take it away. And thank you so much again uh, on behalf of CPI for being here uh, today with us. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so thank you for the invitation to give this talk. <clears throat> and I'll just mention that uh, as Diogo and I were working out the logistics for this talk, it was originally supposed to happen at 4 p.m. And then he said that uh, they took a poll across the department and twice as many people would be available at 2.30. So to me, that means that there were probably two people listening instead of one. So I'm excited to, that both of you are here. <laughs> so thank you for attending this. So this talk is about choosing privacy in the real world. And, uh, and I'll just note, you know, right off the bat, we do need to choose. Uh, privacy does not come by default in most cases any longer. That was maybe true many years ago. It's uh, much less true today. And the focus of this talk is really on what we can do to protect our, our privacy in the world, real world, in our daily lives, and particularly in our online transactions. And so I'll just mention um, in terms of sources that, uh, that this talk is really based on a research paper that I did back in 2006 called The Classification for Privacy Techniques. And that paper was later expanded into a, a course textbook in 2021 called Introduction to Privacy Enhancing Technologies. So most of the content of this talk is really from those two sources, and, uh, and you can go there for more details if you're interested. So in terms of outline, I'll talk a little bit about privacy and privacy enhancing technologies or PETS, uh, and talk about some vulnerabilities in, uh, in our privacy, uh, introduce the classification and then some examples, and then really the focus is on choosing privacy in the real world. So, uh, so privacy, so definitions, there are lots and lots of definitions of privacy. If you look through the literature in many different fields, uh, different contexts, focusing on different aspects of our personal lives, um, people think of privacy as the right to be left alone. They think of it as freedom of thought, maybe control over one's body, solitude in one's home, freedom from surveillance, protection from searches and interrogation, lots and lots of different definitions. But back in 1967, someone named Alan Weston, a privacy researcher, proposed this definition an entity's ability to control how, when, and to what extent personal information about it is communicated to others. And this is really the definition that has been adopted uh, largely within the privacy enhancing technologies community. It's about controlling our personal information, who gets to see it and what they get to do with it. Um, so all of the other definitions, of course, are also relevant and, uh, and impinge on our privacy in, in different ways. But, uh, but within the pets community, this is very often the definition that is used. And again, as I mentioned, there is a need for privacy. Um, protection of our personal information has eroded continuously for many years, and it uh, almost never happens by default any longer. So what can, be, what can go wrong, right? Why do we need to protect our personal information? What could happen if we don't do that? Well, the first thing that a lot of people think about is targeted advertising. Know, a company learns something about you, um, your preferences, your past purchases, and so now they can uh, direct ads that are targeted um, specifically to your interests and your uh, previous history. And that can be a good thing, of course, because then you get advertised the things that you might want to buy next. 
um, but it can also be a little bit of annoy annoying. So it's a little bit of a privacy concern. Maybe a slightly larger privacy concern is physical danger. You know, if uh, if somebody knows where you are because you post that, you know, every morning at 5 a.m. you go jogging in the woods or something like that, then if somebody wants to do you harm, they can just wait there because they know that you're going to be there. On the flip side, if somebody knows where you're going to be, you're going to be at a party on Friday night. That means that you're not going to be at your home. And so maybe your home is uh, going to be empty and that would be a perfect time to break into it. And so physical danger is danger of ourselves, but also danger perhaps of our belongings or our assets. There's the whole world of identity theft, of course. Um, you know, if somebody knows more and more about you, they, they can more effectively impersonate you and maybe take out loans in your name, take out mortgages in your name and that sort of thing, um, disrupting your life in, in many different ways. And there's the whole area of profiling, um, and this can happen from humans, and it can also happen from software doing profiling. And this is ultimately um, people or software making decisions about you, putting labels on you. You are this type of person or that type of person. You belong to this type of group or, or this type of race or whatever it is, and, uh, and then making decisions based on those labels. And so, you know, cutting out choices that are available to you or not allowing you to do things because of labels that have been assigned. And of course, those labels can be assigned erroneously, right? The uh, profiling can make mistakes. And so that can have serious privacy implications as well. And there are lots of other things as well. Those are just a few examples. If we think about what's available to help us protect our privacy, well, of course, there's the whole world of laws and privacy policies and chief privacy officers and all of those things. And those are all um, very good. And, uh, and there are a lot of things that have been in place for a long time and the laws are developing over time. But on top of that, we have these privacy enhancing technologies or pets. And when we talk about pets, uh, just to sum it up very, very generally and briefly, we could think of pets as software or hardware that is specifically designed to protect our privacy. One of the things that's really nice about privacy enhancing technologies is that they can be preventative. So when we think about laws and po privacy policies and chief privacy officers, those are often things that we go to after the fact, after our privacy has been breached, we go and we want some sort of retribution or some sort of uh, payback. But of course, the problem with privacy, you know, it's not like uh, an asset that gets stolen. If your privacy is breached, it's very hard to get that uh, restored in any way. And so the thing that's nice about pets is that they can be preventative. They can stop the breach from happening in the first place because somebody just literally is not able to access your data or your, uh, or your identity. The second thing that's nice is that there are lots to choose from. Uh, this field has been around for over 40 years now, and there have been lots and lots of proposals in the academic literature, in business, and uh, in freeware software, and that sort of thing. There's lots and lots of pets to choose from. Uh, on the flip side, that can be a little bit bad because then how do you know which one to choose, right? If you want to protect your privacy, how do you know which pet you should pick or which collection of pets you should pick? And so that begs the question, well, how do they compare with each other? How can I look at two different pets and say which one is better for me in this particular situation or this particular privacy goal that I have? And fundamentally, what that means is what is the basis for comparison? How is it that we can compare these uh, in order to measure one being better than the other for what we want to do? So we can think about when our privacy is most vulnerable or how our privacy is most vulnerable and see if that helps us. So that leads us to the idea of privacy vulnerabilities. And we can think of maybe two primary areas where our privacy is vulnerable. And the first one has to do with information about your activities. So we can say that against your wishes, in other words, without your consent in any way, somebody learns about your activities. They learn about what you're currently doing or maybe what you've done in the past. 
And so we can think of things like, you know, search engine queries that you've sent out, purchases that you've made, websites that you've visited, videos that you've watched, uh, votes that you cast in various elections or, or uh, other types of schemes, auctions, uh, social media, you know, who have you liked, who have you followed? Uh, sometimes people post rants, right? They go crazy and uh, they get very passionate about some passionate about some topic and they rant for a while and then that goes on their social media. And there's lots and lots of other types of activities that somebody could learn about. The other part of that is learning about you as a person, learning about your data. So again, against your wishes, without your consent, somebody learns information about you as a person, your attributes or your personal data. So things like your home address, your job position, your salary, your bank account number, social insurance number, credit card number, various assets you have, all of those sorts of things are possible. And the observation here that I'd like to make is that this information that we've just talked about only violates your privacy if it can be linked to your identity. In other words, if it can be linked to you. So the fact that somebody visited this website or somebody makes $100,000 a year has no implication at all for your privacy. But if it's learned that you visited the website or you make this particular salary, then your privacy is lost or at least degraded in some way. So that means that in the context of privacy, we can really focus on the link between identity and action and the link between identity and data. And if we can break these two links, then we can somehow preserve privacy. And I'll just sort of note that these links can be broken in three different ways. So the first is that we could hide the identity and let the action or the data remain in the clear. And so that was the example that I just gave. You know, somebody visited this website or someone makes $100,000 per year. Um, you know, the identity is completely hidden. The action or the data is in the clear. On the flip side, we could hide the action or the data and reveal just the identity. So Alice visited some website, but we don't know which one. Alice makes a salary, but we don't know how much it is. And then, of course, the third choice is that we can hide both the identity and the action or data, so nothing is observed at all. And I'll just note in passing that this second one, uh, where you reveal the identity, actually does leak some information. You know, if Alice visited an unknown website, then that might reveal that Alice was online at a particular moment in time. Or if Alice makes an unknown salary, maybe that reveals that Alice is employed rather than unemployed. But typically that amount of information leakage or privacy leakage is fairly small and, uh, and quite acceptable in, in many different contexts. So basically we have these three different ways that we can uh, think about breaking these links. And that ultimately leads to a classification. And so the suggestion is that pets can be classified according to how they break these identity action and identity data links. And so this allows us to compare and contrast pets that have maybe different approaches to enhancing privacy, right? Maybe one is hiding the identity and another one is hiding the data. And so they're approaching uh, our privacy and our privacy protection in different ways. Or they have the same approach to enhancing privacy, but they use different techniques. So they're both protecting identity, but they protect it in different ways. And ultimately, the goal of a classification like this is to allow us to choose the most appropriate pet or the most appropriate set of pets for whatever specific goal we wish to achieve. So if, if what we want to do is hide our action, then we can look in that category of privacy enhancing technologies. If we want to protect our identity, we would look in a different category. And uh, so if we think of uh, the identity action link, there's a whole class of pets that hide the identity while allowing the action to remain visible. There's a class of pets that hide the action while 
allowing the identity to remain visible. And there's a class of pets that hide both the identity and the action. Same thing with the identity data link, class of pets that hide the identity and allow the data to remain visible, a class of pets that hide the data and allow the identity to remain visible, and a class of pets that hide both. So this classification I, I refer to as a privacy tree. And in that tree, as you go from the, the root node down to the leaves, uh, it actually incorporates a number of other decision points, like you know who are you trying to hide the data from and that sort of thing. But ultimately, the privacy focuses on these six approaches to breaking the identity action and identity data links. So we can just walk through a handful of, of examples just to illustrate these different categories. Um, if you look in the book, the textbook, it covers many more examples and covers each example in far more detail than we will do here. But just for the sake of time uh, in this talk, I'll just mention a couple of examples from each class just for the purpose of illustration. So let's start with the identity action link and focus on hiding the identity. So the first one that we can think about is the mix network. So this was proposed by David Chom back in 1981. And this particular pet is generally acknowledged to be uh, the first academic paper on a technique that was explicitly designed as a privacy enhancing technology. And so for many people, this was the landmark paper that, uh, that gave birth the, to this whole field. And Chong was intending this technique to be used in uh, an email environment to give anonymity to the sender of an email. So let's say Alice wants to send an email message to Bob. So Alice's message is going to be encrypted multiple times with different keys. And then it will be sent through the network. And as it goes through the network, each intermediate node will remove one layer of encryption. The other thing that it will do is it will wait until it has collected n different messages from you know, various users and then send the n off as a batch. And so at, uh, at each node, it's waiting until it has received n messages, and then it sends them all off. And it's going to remove that one layer of encryption each time. Ultimately, the plain text message will get to Bob at the very end. And so he will see the content of the message. Anybody that's looking at that last talk will also see the content of the message. But the sender of the message will meet, remain completely anonymous. And so it's hiding the identity while leaving the action uh, visible. Secondly, many years later, back in uh, 1996 through 99, uh, Goldschlag, Reed, and Syverson proposed onion rooting and Tor. And onion rooting, we can think of as having the same sort of idea as a mixed network, but applied to real-time communications environments. So not store and forward network like an email environment, but something uh, essentially real-time in communications. So again, there are layers of encryption. The message that Alice is going to send to Bob uh, will be uh, encrypted multiple times with different keys. And, uh, and they referred to this as an onion. So you think of the message as being wrapped in layers like an onion, and then each intermediate node is going to peel away one, uh, one outside skin of the onion. Uh, but in this scheme, because it's uh, intended for real-time communication, uh, there's no batching at the intermediate nodes, and also we use faster processing. So in particular, they used symmetric cryptography instead of public key or asymmetric cryptography. Again, the receiver gets plain text, but has no idea who the sender was. And Tor is an implementation of onion rooting, and, uh, and it's one of the most widely used pets on the internet today. So if we think of hiding the action instead of hiding the identity, well, one example is TLS, Transport Layer Security. So it began its life as SSL, uh, put forward by Netscape Communications Corporation back in 1994. Um, eventually in 99, it was uh, 
taken on by IETF, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and, uh, and published as an Internet specification and renamed as TLS. And TLS creates this authenticated confidential channel between a web browser and a website. And authenticated means that the two communicating, communicating parties are explicitly known, right? So not just known to each other, but known to anybody else that happens to be observing. They can see who is speaking to each other, but the content of their communication is protected through encryption. And so it's not visible to anybody else. So that's how it's hiding the action while revealing the identity. And of course, TLS, as we know, is built into virtually every browser on the planet. So, uh, so very, very widely deployed. Another example of this class of pets is private information retrieval or PIR. So that was by Chor, Goldreich, and Kuchelevitz in Sudan in 1995. The setting that they had in mind was a database setting. And so the user, Alice, wants to read a particular record from the database, but she doesn't really trust the database administrator for a variety of reasons. And so she would like to be able to retrieve a record without the administrator knowing which record she's trying to achieve or retrieve. And so we can think of it as retrieving record I in general without anybody learning what the value of I is, but somehow she gets the record that she wants. And in their proposal for private information retrieval, there's nothing in that proposal that protects the identity of the requester. So again, the identity is clear to everybody, it's exposed to everyone, but the actual action of retrieving a particular record remains hidden. If we think of hiding both, uh, one example that is uh, fairly well known is IPsec in tunnel mode. So this is uh, security at the network layer. Uh, so this was put out by the IETF IP security working group in 1995. When Alice wants to send a message to Bob, of course, as it gets down to the network layer, her message is broken into packets, uh, internet protocol packets, IP packets, and those are sent across the network through various channels to get to the receiver. So the IP packet that holds some of Alice's message is not only encrypted, protecting its content, but it's also put entirely within the body of another IP packet that has a different sender and receiver in its header. And so clearly that's hiding the actual sender and receiver because because uh, it's a different sender and receiver in the outer layer. And it's also hiding the action, right? The communication, the content of their communication. Another example is OTR messaging, off the record messaging by Borisov, Goldberg and Brewer back in 2004. So their focus was uh, an instant messaging or IM environment. And here the action is again hidden through encryption, but the difference is that the communicating parties authenticate their identities to each other using a MAC, a message authentication code, that's computed using a shared key, a key that's known only to the two of them. And once rekeying has occurred, then that shared key is publicized. The, the previous one is publicized. And so in a sense, the identities are hidden through deniability. Uh, once that previous Mac key has been revealed to the world, then anybody in the world could have been the sender and anybody in the world could have been the receiver. So Alice can deny sending any message by claiming that it could have been anybody else instead. So it's a really interesting approach to uh, to hiding the identities by basically you know, making it possible that anybody could, could have been the sender. If we look at the data side as opposed to the action side, looking at hiding the identity, one example is K-anonymity for, from Samaradi and Sweeney back in 1998. So their context was healthcare data. So healthcare data that is uh, released by research institution, institutions or healthcare organizations made publicly available for the purposes of further research. And the, the proposal is that given a database of information, you're going to release some data 
And this data will have the K anonymity property if the information for each person in the release cannot be distinguished from at least K minus one other people in the whose information is also in the release. So each person is basically uh, residing in an anonymity set of size K. So you have this release data and uh, you, you look at the data and you say, oh, that might match Alice, but it also exactly matches uh, K minus one other people. So you have no way of tying that data to Alice. And so you're hiding her identity in that anonymity set while revealing the data. Second example is credential systems. So these were worked on again by David Chong, who, uh, who gave us mix, mix networks uh, for over a 10 year period, 1982 to 1992, worked on various aspects of credential systems. And then Stefan Brands in the year 2000 um, extended that in a couple of really interesting ways. So a credential is like a public key certificate except that instead of holding a public key, it holds a number of attributes about the owner of the certificate. So maybe it holds their name and their birth date and their uh, home address, their social insurance number, their job title, all sorts of different attributes. And through a protocol interaction with a verifier, the owner can reveal one or more of these attributes while leaving all the remaining attributes unconditionally hidden from the verifier. So even if the verifier had infinite computing power, they can't figure out what the other attributes are. So if Alice's identity is treated simply as one of her attributes, then in any of these protocol interactions, she can just choose not to reveal that. And so that's how she can hide the identity while revealing the data. So hiding the data, multi-party computation is, uh, is becoming quite popular these days. Uh, originally proposed by Andrew Yao back in 1986 as a two-party computation, and then extended by Goldreich, McCallie, and Victorson in 1987 to be an n-party computation. The idea is that you have a number of distinct parties that jointly want to compute a function but each of them has private data that they bring as input to the function, and they don't want anybody else to learn that data. So a simple example is maybe you have two companies, they want to determine which customers they have in common, but neither company wants to re reveal their actual customer list to the other one. So they can compute this two-party uh, computation and figure out which customers they have in common without revealing any of their other customers. Again, if you look at the protocols for MPC, uh, there's nothing in there that hides the identities of the participants. And so the identities are revealed and are known to everyone, but the actual data that each person brings to the computation remains hidden. Uh, another example is differential privacy. <clears throat> so Cynthia Dwork and others back in 2006 Again, information disclosure from a database. And what they were trying to achieve was that any information disclosure will be just as likely whether or not a specific individual was included in the computation. So for example, I send a query to a database and say, what's the average salary of this department? And I will get back an answer that will be essentially the same whether or not a particular person like Joseph whether his salary was included in the computation or not. And they do that, of course, by adding some noise to the answer, a little bit of noise. And so that's why these uh, answers can be roughly the same. So the identities of the participants, again, are public, but whether or not any particular person's data was included in the computation is completely hidden. And the final category is uh, hiding both. So P3P, the Platform for Privacy Preferences project, um, came out of a W3C working group in 2002. Uh, the idea is that a website would have a privacy policy uh, expressing all of their privacy practices, and it would be expressed in a standard format 
that could then be uh, retrieved automatically and interpreted by a, a user agent, a software agent on the user side. And that user agent can inform the user of any problems with the privacy policy and can also automate some decision making about what can be done when the practices are appropriate. So the big win here, of course, is that users don't have to read the privacy policy because uh, you know, it's well known that users tend not to do that anyway. So they don't have to read these policies at all the sites that they go to. And, uh, and of course, the policy can specify whether data remains anonymous that is collected, whether data can be shared with others, whether data must be deleted by a certain time, you know, have a, a retention period and so on. So the policy can specify hiding both the identity and the data. And, uh, and this was a technology that just made it much easier for the user to interact with the website. And finally, credential systems show up again in this category, but this time showing properties of attributes. So when I talked about credential systems before, we said that identity could be treated as just another attribute of Alice. She could choose to reveal it or not reveal it. Um, but we can also hide the data about Alice, hide the attributes themselves by just showing properties of attributes. So for example, Alice could prove that her age was within a particular range without actually saying what her age was. She could prove that maybe she was European without saying which country she was actually a citizen of. And, uh, and in this particular scheme, you can essentially do arbitrarily complex Boolean functions of the user's attributes using connectives like and, or, not, and range properties. So very powerful technique. Okay, so what about choosing? So basically, you know, let's say Alice has watched a bunch of the talks in this uh, very nice seminar series at Waterloo, and she's convinced that privacy is important. She's interested in protecting or enhancing her online privacy. What can she do? How can she choose what to do? And so to me, step one is that she has to weigh the pros and cons. Basically, she has to think about the cost of protecting her privacy. So what does that mean? Well, basically, she has to make some decisions. She has to decide what her privacy is worth to her. In real life, what we find is that protecting privacy always requires some sort of lifestyle change. For example, maybe you need to start doing something that you didn't do before or stop doing something that you were uh, previously doing. Maybe you need to use some less popular software, or maybe you need to avoid using some of your favorite software. Maybe you need to give up trading personal data for discounts or convenience. Maybe you need to stop sharing personal information with unknown people or friends and followers on social networks. Privacy ultimately is going to cost Alice something and she needs to decide what she's willing to pay, what she's willing to give up so that she can have privacy, <clears throat> what ways she's willing to change her life. But step two now is to take the long-term perspective and think about implications, consequences, potential outcomes of any activities that you do today. And so you have to adopt some behaviors. So Alice needs to, actually adopt some explicit behaviors to protect her privacy. So the first thing is that she needs to become knowledgeable about her data. She needs to understand what data is personal. And sometimes it's not immediately obvious, right? We think, oh, my, my name and my salary and, and my social insurance number, that's all personal information. But there may be other things that we don't readily think about that are also personal information. So there was a book by Stephen Make, Baker called The Numerati in 2008, and he gave a great example of a grocery list. So lots of people today have grocery store loyalty cards or points cards, and they seem like a good thing, right? You can get uh, cash back on your purchases, or you might be able to get discounts on purchased items and that sort of thing. But if you think about what somebody could learn about you 
from seeing nothing more than your gro grocery purchases over the course of, say, six months or a year? What could somebody learn just from seeing what you buy in the grocery store? Well, first of all, they might be able to determine how many people live in the house, right? Approximately the ad adults, children, maybe the approximate ages of the children, maybe whether there are household pets. You might be able to tell when somebody in the house is sick, right? Because you start buying chicken soup or you start buying Tylenol, for example. You might be able to tell when you're dating. Maybe you buy better shampoo, maybe you buy better mouthwash or tooth whitener or something like that. You might be able to tell when you're going camping, right? You buy hot dogs, marshmallows. They might be able to see when you're having company or a party and how often that happens. And from that, that can suggest something about your personality, right? How social you are, for example. They might be able to tell whether you're susceptible to things like binges or fads or marketing or sale items, right? A correlation between things that are on sale and what you end up buying. Again, that can suggest something about your personality. Maybe you have some weaknesses. Maybe you have some addictive tendencies. <clears throat> you can see how much money you spend each week on junk food or alcohol that you purchase at the grocery store. Again, you know, maybe someone could conclude from that that you're a risk for health insurance or whatever. There's lots and lots of things, right? So we don't think of our grocery list as private information, but perhaps it really is. So you need to think about the implications of the data that you give away. Secondly, Alice really needs to be aware of the potential risks. Um, so she needs to think about the explicit and maybe invisible harms that could happen to her and even to her loved ones. Right? Because of things that people know about her, data that they've collected about her, maybe she would get turned down for a, a job promotion. Uh, maybe her spouse would be refused a position on a board of some prestigious organization. You know, there are all sorts of risks that could happen from data that, uh, that is being gathered about you. Thirdly, she needs to constrain the ways in which she deliberately gives away her data. So uh, this is both online and offline behaviors. So, you know, a bunch of examples. Uh, we don't have to go through them in detail, but, you know, stop giving away your personal data in exchange for goods and services. Uh, refrain from including personal data in social media platforms, right? What you post on your website or your Facebook wall, uh, what you put in tweets, what you put on your Instagram posts and so on. Uh, consider encrypting private data before you put it to cloud storage, right? Don't just assume that it's secure and, uh, and private while it's sitting in the cloud. Uh, consider examining TLS certificates when you're logging into banks or medical sites or other important services, just to make sure that you're actually going to the site that you think you're going to. Uh, be cautious about responding to surveys and opinion polls and questionnaires, especially if they're asking personal information. Uh, be cautious about giving telephone uh, information to telephone and door-to-door -door solicitors. Um, transmitting sensitive information over open Wi-Fi, especially passwords, you know, in places like cafes and airports and that sort of thing. Configure your home appliances so that they're not reachable from the internet or maybe they're only reachable through your uh, home firewall. Ensure that your personal information is not visible when somebody's looking inside your parked car, right? Maybe you've collected your mail and it's sitting on the front seat and, uh, and it's displaying your address or you know, the place where the mail is from is telling something about you. Avoid pairing your phone with a rental vehicle, or if you must pair it, be sure to unpair it when you return the vehicle. Uh, make use of a paper shredder to destroy any printed material that contains personal details. And on and on and on. There are lots and lots of different ways to be careful about giving away information. And then finally, Alice needs to constrain the ways in which she unintentionally gives away her information. And so this is really where pets come in. 
right? So, uh, so at the very least, maybe consider using Tor for your online activities to make sure that you anonymize them. Uh, make sure that you consider using browsers that block cookies or prevent trackers or delete data on shutdown. But ultimately, this is where pets come in. And so you need to make sure that you choose pets that are strong enough for their intended purpose. And maybe that means, you know, following the research literature to see which ones have been broken or are getting weaker. And, uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, we talk about security in depth using multiple different security technologies. And I think we also need to consider privacy in depth. And perhaps we use multiple different privacy enhancing technologies to make sure that, uh, that we're protected in the, in the case that any of the pets become weaker over time. So just to wrap up, choosing privacy in the real world, just like secu choosing security, it's an ongoing exercise. It's not something that you do once and you're good for the rest of your life. It requires discipline. It requires determination. It requires diligence. And you think, OK, well, this sounds pretty onerous. Do I really want to do this? Well, like any lifestyle change, it can very quickly become habitual and it can feel natural and automatic. It's just like looking both ways before you cross the street. It's just like wearing a seatbelt. Um, you know, it, it just becomes second nature. And ultimately, the idea is that it might just protect you from a host of privacy harms that can irrevocably change and maybe degrade your life. So choosing privacy is always highly recommended. And I think I will stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you very much. For listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Adams, for your excellent talk and uh, lots of good ideas here on how to protect our privacy. So uh, I will now stop the recording and I will also um, open the floor for questions for those who might have them uh, at this point. Okay, thank you.